thinking about where we needed to go today. I thought about how important it is for us to get hold of some basic facts that without them we can't function worth anything inside the family of God. And I found myself over in the Gospel of John, over in Acts chapter 1. In fact, it's your assignment to read Acts 1, verses 1 to 13 every day this week. Acts 1, verses 1 to 13. But we need to go back a little ways. <clears throat> go back prior to Calvary, before the death of Jesus Christ. Jesus had many, many meetings and teaching sessions with the disciples in those three and a half years that he was with them. And then as crunch time came, as it was closer and closer to the time for the crucifixion, he really began to get strong and consistent and overpowering in his teaching concerning the work and the ministry and the coming of the Holy Spirit. And I, I guess it's kind of, uh, kind of nice from a pastor's point of view, and this is, not, this is not any reflection, except everybody's busy. You got a lot of things on your mind. And so when you come to church and, or you go to a class and somebody teaches something, it's easy for it to kind of hit and skid off and go somewhere else. And I look at how Jesus just leaned so heavily on the disciples with this information. And we're gonna see that no matter how heavily he pushed them, it didn't sink in. Now, I think he had 12 guys in a group. And in, in the sessions we talk about, he had 11. One guy had betrayed him and split. Okay? And he is laying this on them. And they still didn't catch on. Now, you can do better work with a small group than you can with a large group. And if Jesus struggled, who am I to think I'm not going to struggle in trying to get across something that may be perfectly clear in my mind, but may not be that clear in the minds of the people that listen to me. One of the reasons that I listen to the sermon tapes every week, I want to hear what I say. I want to try to, to sit still long enough to think, what is it that I said? Did they hear what I said? Do I need to say it more clearly? Do I need to work it another way? And one of the things I found out about Jesus as I study here, he said it over and over and over and over and over again. Go with me to the 14th chapter of John. He's talking to them, beginning at verse 15, <clears throat> some really heavy commands. If you love me, obey me. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another comforter and he will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit, the Spirit who leads into all truth. The world at large cannot receive him for it isn't looking for him and does not recognize him, but you do for he lives with you now and someday shall be in you. That someday is now. At the time he said this, the Holy Spirit was just kind of around. But when we came down to the church era, once the day of Pentecost hit, that's the birth of the church, the body of Christ, the Holy Spirit lives within every believer. He is part and parcel of the entire program. You trust Jesus Christ as your savior, the Holy Spirit comes to live in your body. I don't understand it, I just know it's true. Sometimes we don't live like the Holy Spirit is living in our body. Sometimes we live like the devil himself. And we say to ourselves, how can I be a Christian, Holy Spirit living in me, live like this? Well, that old nature isn't dead. We're supposed to reckon it to be dead, but it's very much alive and can be triggered so easily. And so Jesus is talking to these disciples in this special, special training time just before he went to the cross. He said, I would not abandon you or leave you as orphans in the storm. I will come to you. In just a little while, I will be gone from the world and I will still be present with you. 
for I will live again and you will too. Can you imagine sitting in here listening to this sound like the worst double, double talk in the world? I'm going to leave, but I'm going to still be with you. Now make up your mind. You're leaving, you're going to stick around. They've just been through, and if you get their emotional state into this, they've just been through what we call the Last Supper. You know, that deal where everybody got around to one side of the table for the photographer to take the picture you've always seen? Huh? That's what they've just been through. One of the guys has gotten up and run out, Judas, because he is going to betray Jesus, and you got all this emotion. Jesus keeps talking about dying. And you're trying to figure out what this is all about because you've been thinking over these years there's going to be a new kingdom set up and Jesus kept saying it's not of this world, it's within you and they kept thinking it is of this world and I'm going to be a big shot in this new kingdom. And here he is again saying I'm going to leave but I'll still be with you and and I will live again and you will too and they're saying we're not dead yet and what do you mean we will too and when I come back to life again you will know that I'm in my Father and you in me and I in you. The one who obeys me is the one who loves me. And because he loves me, my Father will love him and I will too and I will reveal myself to him. Now one of the disciples, not Judas Iscariot, he'd already gone, but Judas, another one said, Sir, why are you going to reveal yourself only to us disciples and not to the world at large? And Jesus said, because I will only reveal myself to those who love me and obey me. The Father will love them too, and we will come to them and live with them. Anyone who does not obey me doesn't love me. And remember, I'm not making up this answer to your question. It is the answer given by the Father who sent me. I'm telling you these things now while I'm still with you. But when the Father sends the Comforter instead of me, And by the Comforter, I mean the Holy Spirit. He's saying it again. He will teach you much, as well as remind you of everything I myself have told you. I'm leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give isn't fragile like the peace the world gives. So don't be troubled or afraid. Remember what I told you. I am going away, but I will come back to you again. If you really love me, you'll be very happy for me. For now I can go to the Father who is greater than I am. I've told you these things before they happen so that when they do, you will believe in me. Now, you listen to that pressure in that little statement. You get over to John chapter 15, that passage that I read to you where he's talking about abiding in him and and being loved as the Father has loved Jesus and we're to live within his love, and when we obey him, we are living in his love, just as I obey my Father and live in his love. I've told you this so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your cup of joy will overflow. I demand that you love each other as much as I love you. Jesus put down these incredible demands. We're to love one another as much as Jesus loved us. You can't do that. Not without the power of the Holy Spirit. With the power of the Holy Spirit, it is absolutely possible if you walk in the Spirit. But if that's only a momentary thing coming and going, it it doesn't happen. When you get down in 15 to verse 26, Jesus said, again, I will send you the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, the source of all truth. He is saying the same thing over and over and over again. He will come to you from the Father and will tell you all about me and you also must tell everyone about me. That order has not been rescinded, friend. We have a responsibility to tell others about Jesus Christ consistently. And he has promised that the Spirit will come and live in us so that we can tell everybody about him. And in John chapter 16... Verses 5 to 15, here he goes again. Now he's in the same session with the same bunch of guys. Just because they get a new chapter number doesn't mean it's changed. He was with the same bunch. He's keeping that same pressure down. And he's saying that I'm going to go away, verse 5. None of you seems interested in the purpose of my going. That's a very interesting statement. I've been telling you I'm going to go away. And nobody has said, why are you going away? They keep asking other questions. And Jesus just throws that in. None of you seems to be interested in the purpose of my going. None wonders why. Instead, you're only filled with sorrow. 
but the fact of the matter is it's best for you that I go away. For if I don't, the comforter won't come. If I do, he will, for I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convince the world of its sin and of the availability of God's goodness and of deliverance from judgment. The world's sin is unbelief in me. People, if you ever get that straight, it saves you a whole lot of energy that you can burn trying to run around and stamp out sin. God did not call us as his children to go stamp out sin. That doesn't mean you ought not to take a stand on certain issues. But when you mobilize all the forces and all of the energy and all of the money to go and try to do a thing to stamp out sin, you're off track. The sin of the world is their unbelief in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. That is the heart of the issue. Our responsibility is to tell people who Jesus Christ is, why he came to this earth, why he lived, why he died, why he rose again, and what that means to all of us. The world's sin is unbelief in me. There is righteousness available because I go to the Father and you shall see me no more. There is deliverance from judgment because the prince of this world has already been judged. Oh, there is so much more I want to tell you, but you can't understand it now. When the Holy Spirit, look at here, when the Holy Spirit, who is truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not be presenting his own ideas, but will be passing on to you what he has heard. He will tell you about the future. He will praise me, Jesus. He will bring me, Jesus, great honor by showing you my glory. All the Father's glory is mine, this is what I mean when I say that he will show you my glory. You see, there's a lot of confusion about the work of the Holy Spirit that's unnecessary. And Jesus tried to lay this out so clearly concerning the fact that he would point to Jesus constantly and you don't get lost in some kind of demonstration concerning the Holy Spirit because his job is to point to Jesus and encourage us to tell people about Jesus. And then comes Acts 1. You see, all of this has taken place. Then comes the death of Jesus. Now, they've been on a roller coaster, and it takes a really big dip when Jesus dies. They scatter. They run. They hide out. They're certain that it's over. And then they get the word that he has risen from the dead, and they hide out in a room and lock the doors and the windows and Jesus comes through the wall and says to them, peace be still, and talks to them and encourages them. And he comes back eight days later and says to Thomas, go ahead, put your finger in the print and the nails in my hand. Go ahead, put your, put your hand in the wound in my side. I really am who you think I might be. And here are the disciples, they're in disbelief. And we find them here in Acts 1, and they've met Jesus several times in the room there. They met him up at the Sea of Galilee where he went fishing, and he fixed a little fish on the seashore, and they kept wondering, and he said, touch me, touch me. Uh, give me a little honeycomb and a little, a little uh, something to eat, and I'll eat that for you, and that'll make you know I'm really real. They keep thinking they're seeing a ghost. And he's trying to convince them, I'm really alive. I really am who you think I am. And then he talks to them and he told them in verse 4, chapter 1 of Acts, he told them not to leave Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit came upon them in fulfillment of the Father's promise, a matter he had previously discussed with them. I guess he had again and again and again he had discussed it with them to try to get that poked into their mind. And he said, John baptized you with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit in just a few days. You see, the, the importance of listening to this command, go and wait. Great verse, Isaiah 40, 31, one of the great memorized verses in all of Scripture. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. He says, wait for the power of God, and this is a strong command to them. We gain more power, more courage, more peace when we learn to wait. When we're willing to trust God and demonstrate we are trusting God. Many of you in this crowd right now are living in difficult circumstances. You're in a situation that is upside down. 
You're in a financial bind. You don't know how you're ever going to get out. And if you don't change your habits, you never will get out because you didn't get there overnight. You got there through a series of bad decisions and bad planning or no planning at all. Some of you are in great difficulty in a marriage relationship and you don't know which way to run. Some of you are in great difficulty because you're thinking about a job that's about to fold up. This recession thing is hitting you. It's getting the squeeze is on. And you know there are a lot of little meetings going on in a lot of places and you're not sure there's going to be a job for you tomorrow morning. That's stress, my friend. I may not hit the thing right on the money that is causing you stress, but I know that across any crowd of this size, there is so much hurt and so much difficulty and so much so much confusion of people not being able to find their way. A part of what I want you to do is just slow down, stop long enough to wait on God. If we are his children, if he has tattooed our name in his hand, we're special. If we can ever get it through our heads that he loves us more than we love our kids, make all the difference in the world in how we respond to him. And when you find yourself waiting upon the Lord, meditating in his word, somebody says, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm so confused, I can't even study the Bible. Well, buddy, you are confused then. Then the best thing you can do is just read this until the confusion clears up. Because you're not gonna get conf any less confused reading some secular publication. You realize all the bad news there is? I'm, I'm gonna tell you, I've cured myself a habit I had for many years. Used to always stay up and watch the 11 o'clock news. That is dumb. That is just stupid. What is the news? It's every bad thing you can think of they're telling you about and you get all that poked in your mind just before you go to bed. Guaranteed to disturb your sleep. Guaranteed to renew in your mind the notion that the world is in such an awful mess. Well, you just, just read. I read that goofy thing here this week that, that uh, some folks are gathering in some weird little cultic type thing and they're praying to Mother Earth. And all this talk about Mother Earth. Mother Earth. There's no talk about Father God, but there's a lot of talk about Mother Earth. And Mother Earth is in deep trouble. Mother Earth is falling apart. And there are folks doing little strange, weird, kind of semi-religious things. But they don't want to get near the Bible. I watched the confusion of people out there in the marketplace. I watched a thing on uh, an old Hugh Downs show the other night. I've been doing some reading. Because of my interest in working with men, I've been doing some reading about men's conferences have nothing to do with God, not a blooming thing. But they take these men out and they help these men think about when they were boys and they never identified properly with their father and they never had the rite of passage. That's a great phrase, isn't it? It's like a window of opportunity and a rite of passage. And they beat little drums and they cry and they wail and they yell. Old Hugh was right out there with this camera going on these guys that were just hooping it up. I mean, these are businessmen. These are bright guys. These are scholars. And they go out there in the woods and they have this wild time for several days. I'm going to tell you who they never mention in that whole thing. God. God. He is just left out. Like he doesn't count and as I continue to watch the secularization of our society, I feel that we need to be living under the responsibilities that Jesus clearly outlined for us in his word, that we need to be sure of him as the leader. That's one of the reasons he wanted to wait. Are you really sure in your mind that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he really is the leader, that there is no other way for salvation to come to an individual? If you get sure of that, the rest of the message makes sense. But if you're not sure of that, you think there are 40 ways to get it done, and there aren't. 
Jesus one of these people to wait for God's time and God's strategy and to allow God to work through them, not people who would work for God. I'm always suspect of people who say, well, I'm working for God. I want God to be working through me. That's the plan. That's why he has given us the Holy Spirit to live in us, to give us direction in the decisions that we make and the attitudes we have and the responsibilities that we carry. And one of them who wasn't listening piped up in the middle of all of this and said, Lord, are you going to free Israel from Rome now and restore us as an independent nation? I wonder what kept Jesus from reaching out and backhanding the guy. You dumb dip, why don't you listen? Still thinking about the here and now. If we can just get it established here and now. Folks, this planet is going to burn up and everything that we own is gonna go with it. That's absolute sure. And we are so hooked to this life and this planet and this power that we can't get it through our minds. God has a kingdom that is not of this world. We're as dumb as this dip, they didn't even give his name. He couldn't even get credit for his dumb remark. And Jesus just brushed him off. Jesus said, the Father sets those dates and they're not for you to know. That's a pretty good jab in public. You know that? Just think about saying, Lord, are you going to restore the kingdom now? That's for the Father to know and it's not for you. I think there was a tone. I don't think Jesus had that syrupy, sweet voice that the movies always give him. I don't think he said, that's for the Father to know, my friend. And it is not for you to, I don't think that at all. I think pow to the moon with you. And a little Jackie Gleason attitude in there that said, you know, that's a dumb thing. You need to be clipped for it. If you pay attention, if you listen when we're back there and I was trying to teach you all this stuff, you would understand something. And Jesus launched right into it again. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, it hasn't happened yet, but it's going to, you will receive power to do one thing, to testify about me with great effect, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, ends of the earth, about my death and my resurrection. People, that is the bottom line responsibility of every believer, to testify under the power of the Holy Spirit to the people all around us concerning the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And periodically, it is important for me to remind you from this pulpit of our purpose. To remind you that we attempt to encourage you in accomplishing this purpose and not just sitting around saying I'm a failure and I can't do it. Get you going out there doing it and seeing what's happened. Seeing how it will work in your life if you'll just share the truth. And if you're in a right frame of mind, I'm gonna tell you one reason why. We run services like we do. I want you to go out these doors pumped up. I want you to go out to my Sunday service and man, I'm glad I was there. Boy, that place is exciting. There's some good things going on. Great music. Good time with all this Gloryland band of ours down here this morning. Just a wonderful time in a service. I was going to a wedding out here in the weeds yesterday and, and uh, as I went past a construction site, I saw a friend squirt, squinting down through a, a transit. And I thought, I think I know that guy. And I turned around and went back. I had a few minutes to kill. I always hate to get places early. And uh, so I went back. And sure enough. And I got out and we began to talk. Asked him how he was doing, what was going on. Doesn't go to this church. Goes to a guy I've known a long time. And he began to talk about what was going on in his life. And he wanted to know what was happening here. And I was talking to him about what's going on here. Good things happening. Talking about the crowd going to Borneo. Talking about our junior high bunch over there at the coast this week. Talking about that married couple's bunch that's over there at the coast. Talking about people that are preparing their lives and, and going into missionary service. And talking about the unreached people group thing we're doing down there in Erie and Jaya. 
and, and figuring that that thing is, is going to be on target, moving right along, going to accomplish the purpose to reach some people that have never heard of Jesus Christ. And we talked about 20 minutes. And he said, man. He said, I'm going to tell you something. I can't remember the last time I talked to a believer and got encouraged. Thanks for stopping. Well, I got in my car and I drove away and I thought, great, Gussie alive. Why does the guy stay where he is every Sunday and go through that pain? I'm not saying we're the only pebble on the beach, but I'm saying this. If I were going to a place and nobody's encouraging me, friend, I'm gone. And if you're coming here and you're going out the door and saying, well, that's sick, I'm tired of it, go somewhere else. You got permission. Go someplace where they can tell you something you can understand, where they can bless you, where you can get excited, where you can walk away saying, boy, that was really good. But when I drove down the street and thought about this guy, he's a good guy, married, got kids, good guy, loves the Lord. And he's so blame discouraged, there's no way in God's world that he can tell anybody about how wonderful it is to be a Christian. Because he's hanging out with a bunch that don't know how to encourage one another. And then Jesus said to these guys, I want you to wait and I want you to get going in a prayer meeting. And that's what they did. They went and held a prayer meeting in an upstairs room of the house where they're staying. And the, the meeting went on for several days, the prayer meeting, several days. You ever been to a several day prayer meeting? Not me. Well, I wear out. I don't know about you, but I wear out. But we need to learn to take time to pray. I, I've got an assignment for you. It's got two parts. I want you to read that Acts 1, 1 to 13. I want you to think about who Jesus is. Is he really your leader? Do you see him as the leader? Do you recognize that in Acts 2, the Holy Spirit showed up and the church as we know it was formed? And the Spirit of God lives inside every believer. And we ought to have some ministry encouraging one another so that we have the, 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 the charisma to go out there and tell people about Jesus. And here's how, what I want you to do this week. Along the way, wherever you are. When you get someplace and you're with a bunch of believers, I want you to be the person that takes the lead and says, let's pray. Let's pray. You get with, with some other believers, you be the one that says, let's pray before we go. You know how important that is? I was out there in the country yesterday, I dropped by to see some folks and, and they're, they're just pulling a heavy load right now. Just wheeling in the driveway and they came out, just stood in the drive and talked for about 15 minutes before I left put my arm around that man and prayed with him and prayed for him. That's important. Not just that the pastor do it. That's important that we do that for one another. Here's what I want you to do this week. You get with believers, one or two or five or nine or 20, before you break up and run away, stop and say, let's pray a minute before we go. I'm going to tell you something. Folks, we could cut a swath through this town that Satan wouldn't be able to cover up. We just talk to God about people to get ready to talk to people about God. Old John Stott, he's a bright one, written some great stuff. He said this, before Christ sent the church into the world, he sent the spirit into the church. And when we will open ourselves to let the Holy Spirit do his strong and wonderful work in our lives, we'll be doing what Jesus told us we're supposed to do. Tell people about him. And I'm hoping this week that you have some great and incredible times praying with people. Just taking time, put your arm around and pray with them. Let them know you care about them. 
And watch what God does in your own life while you're doing ministry in the lives of other people. Now, folks, I know I'm asking some of you to do something that's pretty foreign to you. You pray at meals, maybe. You do a little now I lay me down to sleep thing when you go to bed. When you get up in the morning, you don't know whether to say good morning, Lord, or good Lord, it's morning. I want to encourage you. Take a courageous step. This week. And just see what happens. Lord bless us as we go from here. Fun to talk to people out of uh, the kind of freedom you give me here. Freedom to challenge folks to pick up on an assignment. And to pray, to pray specifically and beautifully for people they touch. I think there could be some great stories floating around this campus next Sunday if we have the courage to follow through. So bless us as we go. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks. You may run along. See you later.